Good afternoon, everybody. It's Dr. Galvin with today's coronavirus update. Today's our first day back at the office for real. We've been seeing patients telehealth-wise for a while now and have been working out of the house primarily, but today we're back in the office, so been a little bit chaotic. Uh, sorry about the late post last night. I have been incredibly busy and I'm trying to get these videos out but uh, I didn't get it out till like 10.30 last night. But it's an interesting topic about whether or not you can get COVID from hair dryers. So if there's any interest, take a look at it. For tonight, uh, as usual, I'm Dr. Jeffrey Galvin, I'm a board certified emergency medicine uh, physician that also runs a wellness and human performance uh, functional medicine clinic. Numbers today, 4.4 million cases worldwide, 298,000 deaths. 1.56 million recoveries in the US, 1.4 million cases, 86,000 deaths. 247,000 recoveries in our state of North Carolina, uh, 16,500 cases, five, I'm sorry, 615 deaths. So topics tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about convalescent plasma and an initial study that shows it's at least safe to use. It doesn't really tell much about the efficacy of it. Some more information about that Kawasaki-like disease, that inflammatory disease that children are developing. Um, with some interesting information out of Italy that it's probably related to the coronavirus. And lastly, someone asked a question about herd immunity, and I'm going to try to explain what exactly herd immunity means. So first off, you know, convalescent plasma is something that we have talked about, I think, going back, you know, for one of the very first or second videos, I think I mentioned it. And it's an ancient sort of therapy that you take somebody that's had an infectious disease like a virus, and you draw off their blood and you kind of spin off their plasma and you take the plasma and you inject into another person and that plasma contains antibodies which presumably will bind to the virus and help the second person um, fight off the infection or potentially if it's a healthcare provider or something like that you could give them convalescent plasma and maybe prevent them from getting infected. So it's been trialed. There are a number of, of clinical trials going on, but one big question that needs to be answered is, is it safe or not? And there's a pre-release, meaning a non-peer-reviewed study that was just, uh, just came out that um, looked at 5,000 critically ill patients. So these are people that were in the hospital, and I think 66% of them were in the ICU. So these are like the sickest of the sick. And they were given convalescent plasma, and they looked at you know allergic or and in, in, in bad reactions within a few hours of receiving that because if you're going to have a, a serious reaction, it's going to happen within a couple hours. And they showed that the the rate of severe reactions was less than one percent. There were a couple of cases that they thought that had very significant um, complications that potentially may have led to death, but you know less than one percent had any kind of complications at all. In the study-wide population, there was about a 16.5% mortality rate, but um, they don't say much about what that's being compared to, and this wasn't really a study to look at the efficacy of convalescent plasma. It was a study to look at the safety of using it. So based on this, and 5,000 patients you know, is not a small number, and if the peer review agrees, then at least it tells us that, hey, this is we're not going to kill a bunch of people by doing this. And we wouldn't expect that they would, but that's good news to know that it doesn't look like it's causing that. Next, we've talked about this Kawasaki's disease-like syndrome. And Kawasaki's disease is a very, very rare pediatric condition. It's an inflammatory condition. It typically presents with with high, high fevers and rash and swelling and maybe some, some sores in the mouth, conjunctivitis. And it's a uh, very sort of famous medical school test question because it has these very particular symptoms and it's very, very rare. And, and many people have never seen it. I've only seen really one full-blown case of Kawasaki's. I've seen ones that were questionable Kawasaki's, but really only one really big case. Now, severe cases can, be, can lead to death most kids recover, but it's really rare. And so the Bergamo region of, of Italy, which is where a large amount of their COVID cases, that huge, terrible outbreak they had occurred, um, they've published a, a, a study that is peer reviewed in one of the uh, Italian journals that showed that eight of 10 of these kids that are developing the syndrome um, have antibodies against coronavirus. So it does seem like it's clo closely associated in it, with it. And also in that paper, and I want to make sure I get my numbers right, in the last five years in that region, 
there have been only 19 cases of Kawasaki's in the entire region. And in one month between uh, the end of March and the um, end of April, there were 10 cases. So there's like a 30 fold increase in number of cases than would be expected. And so we do think that this is a rare complication from related somehow to coronavirus and COVID-19, although the, the you know, we're, we're still very early in the, in the preliminary phases. Now, for the parents out there that are worried about their children, you know, I don't think that there's much to worry about. It's still exceptionally rare. So we've talked about some of the things to look at. You know, persistent high fevers for more than five days is one of the hallmark symptoms. So if you've got a child that's having high, high fevers that are lasting, you know, five days or longer, or they're, you know, they're having fevers really high for three days and they, they start changing behavior, they stop drinking, they stop peeing, things like that. Those are things to call your doctor about. And it may be that we need to do some more testing. Uh, I don't think, I don't want people to get, you know, freaked out about it because, again, it's, it, we're talking about a tiny percentage of people. We're seeing that there were a couple deaths in New York City, so it's potentially bad. But, you know, be good parents. Look out for the kids. You know, what, you know what's right and what's wrong. You know when an illness is not sort of the normal illness. And that's when you pick up the phone or you go to the emergency department and the physicians there will make sure that your child is safe. Last thing I wanna talk about is I had a, a viewer question about herd immunity and you know, what exactly does that mean? And it's actually, you know, an interesting, it's actually a relatively simple concept. So the idea of herd immunity is that if you have enough members of a population who are immune to a particular infection, either being having either by having the infection and developing immunity to it, or via vaccination, then you indirectly provide protection for everybody else, and that's why you know childhood immunizations we we, we rely on herd immunity, and you know there are different numbers, but we think 60 to 70 percent of the population is enough to sort of quash an infection, and why does it 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 why does that help? Well, because once you achieve that number of, of people who are immune, then whatever it is, whether it's a, a bacteria or a virus, and in this case a virus, it just doesn't have any, it doesn't have many acceptable hosts anymore. And so you increase the numbers that are immune, you decrease the chance of that virus becoming exposed to somebody who's either unimmunized or not immune. And then what happens is numbers drop off and eventually those viruses you know, go away. Now, we may have seasonal variation, but that's the idea of herd immunity. And that's why it's really important to look at these antibody studies, because those antibody studies will give us, if they're done correctly and the tests are good, and the ones we're starting to get now, like we just have, now we just now in our clinic got access to an antibody test that is 100% sensitive and 99.9% .9 specific, which is exactly what you want. It'll be positive if you've been, if you've been exposed, and it'll be negative if you, if you haven't. Now that we have levels of testing that is that accurate, we'll be able to get a better sense of what is the predominance and the prevalence of the infection in the community. And that will help us drive, you know, restrictions, drive opening up. And if we've got areas that there's a very low percentage, then we need to be extra careful in those areas versus areas that have very high percentages. And, you know, we've talked about Sweden and we might come back to that. You know, Sweden has had a much higher death rate than their neighbors, but they've also have a much higher rate of immune uh, individuals in their population. And ultimately, it may work out that they reach herd immunity far beyond, far before anybody else. So I'm going to stop it there. Um, we'll be back tomorrow with more. I am going to probably start doing these on a bit of a scheduled basis and maybe not posting COVID things every day. For one, I mean, you guys have got to be sick of COVID, right? Um, and, and I feel like a, a great responsibility to get this out every day. And it, I have patients to take care of. I'm in the emergency department. I've got a family that does occasionally like to talk to me. Um, and so I may start doing these more on a scheduled basis. I apologize for that. But I'm going to try to also be able to film more wellness content. And it's hard for me to do both. Anyway, as usual, if you like this, please subscribe to our YouTube page, um, hit the little bell, follow us on Facebook, like us on Facebook. I'll be back tomorrow. Wash your hands, take care of yourselves, take care of your families, take care of those around you, and I'll see you later. Bye.